I gave a, um, a lecture once in, my, uh, in an introductory sociology class and everyone was sitting at the back, spread out and sitting in the back. Um, and um, so what I did was to walk to the very back and have them turn around. <laughs> I'm tempted to move the podium over here, and, uh, but I do want to thank you, Professor Williams, uh, Professor Olson, other faculty and fellows of the Wheatley Institution, for your uh, invitation to come and your warm welcome. This is my first trip to Provo and uh, uh, to uh, BYU, and I'm delighted to be here. Thank you very much. I do want to warn you that I am a bit old school. I don't have PowerPoint. Um, I'm not very funny, um, but um, and, I'm, and I've also, uh, as the other uh, participants in this conference know, I'm not a very practical person, but I think the kinds of things I want to say today will wrap around to the most practical issues possible, so bear with me. Um, I'll ask you for that. In the realm of lived experience, there is no such thing as ethics or morality, at least not as an analytically distinct and hermetically isolated discourse. Ethical and moral discourse in lived experience is always of a fabric with history, biography, aesthetics, social and political institutions, and so on. There is then something artificial about any discussion of the state of the ethics, which is what this conference has really been all about, that does not at least aspire to make sense of this complex tangle of factors. Even lay people tell stories of how all these factors tie together and they fix their lives and identities within those stories. So what are the narratives? While not mutually exclusive, they're at least two popular and largely opposing narrative streams concerning the state of the ethics or state of morality in contemporary life. These narratives have a long history in the West, though they've been told with different specifics within different generations. These are important for many reasons, but not least because they form a backdrop for much of the academic discussion of the moral life today. The first narrative is the narrative of liberation. And it begins with a picture of the past in which social life was morally homogeneous. This uniformity was sanctioned by convention and enforced by a network of ruling institutions, religious, familial, and political, institutions that not only stood guard over the boundaries of moral behavioral propriety, but in more subtle ways reinforced the threshold of shame. The moral life of more traditional societies then was socially, behaviorally, and psychologically domineering toward the majority and its cruelty toward those few who, for whatever reason, actually violated its strictures was often hard, merciless, and vindictive. The challenge to the authority of these institutions and their leaders has, in recent generation, led to a loosening up of its moral codes, providing greater personal autonomy on how to live, a protection of individual liberties, and at the psychological level, a liberation from guilt. The excesses of liberty and the range of illicit behavior is a problem, but a problem best dealt through the enactment and enforcement of rules, regulations, and principles. The narrative of decline, the other narrative, begins with much the same picture of the past, and yet the milieu of moral hom homogeneity in traditional cultures, while rooted in convention, was in fact enforced by a consensus of conscious free agents who enjoyed the ordered liberty that a strong moral code and the character types that derived from it provided. The challenge to the moral authority of the leading social institutions has been the initiative of activists and extremists on the margins of the social order. Their unlikely but remarkable success may have provided more autonomy for people but it also generated a permissiveness in the culture that has led to the derision of wholesome virtues, a contempt toward social authority and the order it provided, and untold human costs measured in the ruin of marriages, the breakdown of families, 
the increase in crime and violence and a range of socially irresponsible and destructive behaviors. Though rules and regulations have their place in addressing these issues, the decline in moral behavior is best addressed through the renewal of character, the cultivation of the constraints that are internal to consciousness. So those are the two main storylines. And there may be some truth in both of those narratives, but what makes them difficult to reconcile is that each is surrounded by a certain quality of myth, which means that in popular consciousness, they are more powerful than the historical evidence actually allows. These myths are also linked to different and competing political agendas with extensive institutional support in special interest groups and political parties. As such, the discourse on the state of the ethics in our society is at best clouded from the start. It is true that all, narrat all narratives, in a way, are ex post facto readings or interpretations of history and experience. And these are no different. Both, in my view, are inadequate accounts of what are, in fact, complex changes that are deeply rooted in the structures of late modernity. My purpose this afternoon is not so much to affirm or critique one or the other, but if anything, to do an end run around both of those narratives by offering a more complex reading of the state of the ethics, of state of ethics, and to offer some considerations as to what might be done to enhance ethical standards, sensitivity, and, and practice. So in the end, this might be an alternative narrative, but I don't really intend it to be anything so elaborate or grand. I really just want to introduce some new elements into the pictures that we have. So my talk this afternoon will have four main parts. And here, the, let, let me give some background for this. All cultures, all civilizations are formed in a trialectic between structure, social organization, ideas, and the actions of institutions and individuals. So let me try to make my case by addressing these three main factors. I'll first consider some structural factors at work in our historical moment. I'll then reflect on changes in the world of ideas and how they relate to those structural factors. Next, I'll consider the strategies we've devised for addressing these challenges and the way these strategies tend to prove problematic. And finally, I'll bring my remarks to a close by looking at some things that I hope might help us think um, um, differently about our, our present challenge. So let me launch right in with the first part, um, talking a little bit about some of the structural factors. And I want to introduce uh, two concepts. These are the, the concepts of deinstitutionalization and subjectivization. All right? It's long words. What scholars call modernity, early, high, and late, is a complex knot of structures, processes, and ideas that defy easy summary. Over its duration, modernity has been characterized by technological innovation, scientific discovery, institutional differentiation, bureaucratic rationalization, cultural pluralism, from which follows urbanization and the proliferation of the media of mass communication, social and geographic mobility, all of these things seem to be tied up in what we call modernity. The net effect of the intense convergence of these uniquely modern processes is what the German social theorist Arnold Galen has described as deinstitutionalization. It's a very important concept, and to understand it, you have to begin with Galen's general theory of institutions. This is not as complicated as it may sound, so let me just launch in. The basis of Galen's theory of institutions is an understanding of the biological constitution of the human animal. Biologists have shown that in relation to the rest of the animal world, 
The human organism is incomplete at birth. Human beings are, in a way, instinctually deprived. Ducks know how to swim, birds know how to fly. Human beings don't know how to live, okay? We're instinctually deprived. This means that there is no biologically grounded structure through which, our, through which humans channel their, our, our externalizing energies, nor is there a single environment to which the human organism must become accustomed, like fish in water, something like that, okay? Unlike the rest of the animal world then, human experience at birth is open, unchanneled. The problem is that this is biologically and psychologically intolerable. Human beings cannot survive in these circumstances. What are institutions? Very simply, institutions are human constructions that provide for human beings what their biology does not. Institutions function like instincts in that they pattern individual conduct and social relationship into habitual and socially, in, in a habitual and socially predictable manner. Not only do they establish behavior with a pattern, but institutions provide human experience at the cognitive level with an intelligibility and a sense of continuity. And so by living within the well-defined parameters of a matrix of institutions, Human beings don't have to reflect on their actions. They can take their social world for granted. What this means is that institutions exist and operate as a stable background to their experience. But institutions and the background that they provide to human experience is not all of experience. Against this background is a foreground, a zone of life in which the individual, in fact, does reflect, ponder, deliberate, and makes choices. So the former, that is the background, institutions, this matrix of institutions, provides the structural context for the foreground, for choice, reflection, and so on. Galen's argument is that deinstitutionalization occurs when an aspect of our culture that used to be taken for granted becomes a matter of choice. What used to be part of the background now becomes part of the foreground. And so marriage is deinstitutionalized when the normative codes regulating a specific type of social arrangement lose their plausibility and thus the structure and functioning of that nuptial relationship becomes open-ended, a matter of choice, all right? According to Galen, one of the most important aspects of modernity is that the foreground of choice is growing and the background of stable institutional patterns is receding. Modernity is characterized, in other words, by an unprecedented degree of deinstitutionalization. And yet the processes of deinstitutionalization take place mainly in the private sphere, in the private realm of personal and family life and other primary relationships. The areas of child rearing, courtship, marriage, sexuality, vocation, religious belief and practice, consuming be, uh, patterns, leisure, the basic norms which guide social behavior and social exchange are, in advanced industrial societies, all radically deinstitutionalized. Things that used to be taken for granted, now we have to think about, ponder, reflect, and choose. And this is different. This is distinctive about the modern age. But this isn't the end of the story. According to Galen, there's a corollary to the process of deinstitutionalization, and he calls it subjectivization. And what do I mean by that? When over the course of time, stable institutional routines and patterns, habits of life, are rendered implausible, when they're no longer taken for granted, individuals must choose how to live. Choosing means that you necessarily turn inward 
to the realm of your own subjectivity, where one has to continuously reflect, ponder, and probe one's newfound choices. Personal autonomy, that is doing one's own thing, then is not simply a social fashion, but rather a structural necessity in the context of modernity. The German social philosopher Helmut Schelsky described this phenomenon as permanent reflectiveness. Permanent because it is intrinsic to the modern world. And nowhere do we see these dynamics of deinstitutionalization and subjectivization play out more than in the realm of identity. In times past, if you were born into a certain family, there was just no question of who you would be and what you would become. I imagine somewhere back in my past, in fact, I can trace it pretty accurately to uh, the highlands of Scotland, um, my family were a family of hunters, and there was just no doubt about what succeeding generations would become, okay? But now it's a matter of choice, all right? It's a matter of reflection. And this, this, this transformation this, the, and the turning inward that, is, that follows upon it uh, of trying to figure out within oneself who one is and what one is to do um, has, has, has been mirrored at the same time with the growth of psychology and psychiatry, disciplines that are designed to help you figure out who you are, all right? That is the rise and triumph of a therapeutic culture um, has mirrored these very, these, these structural processes. So the first thing that I'm saying here is that part of what's going on in the state of our ethics is in fact um, a structural transformation, something that call, Galen calls deinstitutional, deinstitutionalization and subjectivization. The background of taken for granted life has receded and things that one used to assume to be true and right and good and how to live are now matters of choice. And, and once they are a matter of choice, you have to turn inward, all right? So deinstitutionalization and subjectivization are structural features of the modern and late modern world. And what I mean by that is that the individual has little or no control over that. But this is not the only dynamic at play. Here, let me move to the second part. Culture, as I say, is formed in a trialectic between structure, ideas, and action. So let's move to the second part, the realm of ideation, the realm of ideas. Here my interest turns to one of, if not the, the most prominent strain of thought coming out of the Enlightenment, Romantic Modernism. Romantic Modernism was and is a movement within high culture. It's a complex phenomenon to be sure. It's a philosophy, it's an aesthetic, an ethic, and even mythic ideal all at the same time. Its roots, as I say, trace to certain streams of enlightenment thought. And through the 19th century, it found expression in such wide-ranging movements as transcendentalism, abstract impressionism, and the literature of Arnold, Whitman, Blake, Wordsworth, Coleridge, Shelley, Hawthorne, and Melville. In the 20th century, the same impulse has found a voice in liberal religious thought, the beat movement, humanistic psychotherapy, and in intellectual fashions such as existentialism, liberation theologies, and post-structuralism. In their most basic contours, the philosophy and literature of romantic modernism derived from traditional theology. In effect, the movement sought to sustain the inherited cultural order of Christianity, but without its dogmatic understructure. In other words, it sought to sustain the moral and aesthetic ideals of traditional faith, but without their creedal foundations. In an age dominated by speculative rationality and progressive humanism, orthodox theology was no longer tenable. Among the urban, well-educated classes, traditional dogma and its assorted pieties simply had to be abandoned. And yet the moral ideals 
that Christendom had bequeathed to the late 18th and 19th century. Such ideals as benevolence, civility, and justice all retained a deep and profound existential relevance. The task then was to reconstitute moral philosophy to make it intellectually acceptable as well as emotionally and spiritually fitting to the times. To do this, the traditional Christian narrative and its central creedal concepts were both demythologized and reconceived. Now there's a long and complex story here that I won't go into. Let me just say that at the heart of this reconstitution of theology and moral philosophy was an attempt to relocate the value, uh, the, the source of moral value and significance. The earliest streams of Romantic modernism aspired to establish moral significance in a high view of nature, nature with a capital N. Transcendentalists, for example, sought to ground their view in this way as have a certain, certain streams of liberal theology. Because the person was part of the natural order, they could no longer entertain the notion that the self was inherently evil. Traditional theological conceptions of human nature were turned inside out. The core of our being was not just benign, rather each self was a portal of the divine, a natural repository of inborn qualities, capacities, and talents, not least of which was a disposition toward goodwill, kind-heartedness, fair play, and so on. So to cultivate good in the world, it was only necessary to encourage inborn dispositions and capabilities into their full maturation. But for all of their efforts to establish metaphysical grounds for this view, its advocates could never move significantly beyond a, a, a persistent subjectivism. The early romanticists eventually abandoned their metaphysical aspirations and concluded instead that the only conceivable source of value and purpose was the necessity of the individual self. In this light, neither nature nor any deity was the source of value, but only the occasion for humankind to protect it. Culture and the order it provided merely symbolized self-generated values. In principle, therefore, anything that repressed emotion or constricted individual autonomy or violated the individual's expressive freedom undermined the development of the self's natural endowments and capabilities. And its net effect would be to fashion a self that existed in opposition to its true and natural propensities. Repressed selves would in turn reproduce an oppressive social order. And so the goal was to liberate the individual from all of these constraints. Institutions continue to exist, of course, but their legitimacy now depends upon their capacity to accommodate the expressive and utilitarian needs of the individual. With this reorientation, not only would, be, would people be restored, but society itself would be renewed in the process. In sum, romantic modernism is the cultural foundation for what Charles Taylor has called the age of authenticity. It has fostered a subjectivism, a kind of theory of subjectivity, a subjectivism marked by the optimistic assumptions about the inherent benevolence abiding in all people, the moral significance of the individual's expressive needs, the absolute moral uh, priority of the unhindered and unencumbered individual over the exigencies of the group, as well as its antipathy towards social convention and traditional institutions. This subjectivism provided a framework of literary, artistic, and intellectual legitimacy, in other words, to the subjectivization already at work in the structures of modern life. It was also utterly compatible with and reinforced other, the other key stream of enlightenment thought, which is utilitarianism. 
in at least two key respects, the autonomy of the self from all social encumbrances and the sovereignty of the self as the final arbiter of moral judgment. What I'm saying here, as I bring this second part to a close, is that the structural and the ideational are overlapping. These are obviously very different spheres of reality, and thus they operate on very, uh, according to very different dynamics. And yet to use the old Weberian concept, they have an elective affinity for each other. They share the same ideological structure. But here again, if culture is formed and sustained in a trialectic between structure, ideation, and agency, then how do our strategies of moral action fit into this situation? Going beyond structure and ideas, let's move to action and see how our strategies of moral action and agency fit into this situation. Now, a lot of my own research is not on business, um, as it has not been on business ethics at all, in fact, but on the moral formation of the young. And so I'll focus my attention more on this, recognizing that while informed by different streams of philosophical reasoning, there are significant points of overlap with other forms of moral and uh, ethical education. Perhaps the enduring subtext in the evolution of moral and ethical education in America and its continuing story to the present has been a subtext of the quest for inclusivity. Okay? While the need to provide moral and ethical instruction has never been questioned in American history, neither has the impulse to accommodate an ever-widening diversity of moral cultures in the modern world. Inclusion is a strategy for dealing with the, challenging, with the challenge of expanding pluralism. In the face of potentially contentious and disruptive differences, this strategy neutralizes the possibility of conflict. For the most practical sense, inclusion means that no one's interests are neglected, no one is left out, and therefore no one is slighted or snubbed or offended. One theorist captured the sum and substance of the quest for inclusivity when he stated, and I quote, certain moral values can be taught in school if the teaching is restricted to principles about which there is essentially no disagreement in our society, okay? This provision has become the unspoken imperative of all moral education. And, in, and as I look at the young, the psychological models, the neo-traditionalist or neoclassical models, and the communitarian models. Let me just illustrate uh, fairly quickly here. Among the developmental and uh, educational psychologists who have dominated the field since mid-century, the framework for an inclusive moral education derives from their theories of moral agency. Simply put, if moral dispositions are innate within all human beings, then the objective of moral pedagogy is to call out those dispositions into consciousness, particularly in the formation uh, formative stages of childhood development. Lawrence Kohlberg's cognitive developmentalism that was so influential in the 1970s and 80s was only the most audacious attempt to elucidate this framework, uh, the universal characteristics of moral development. A moral principle, Kohlberg argued, is a mode of choosing, okay? A mode of choosing which is universal, a rule of choosing which we want all people to adopt always in all situations. In particular, the principle of justice is, and I quote, always the same ideal form regardless of climate and culture, end quote. Only by turning justice into an abstract universal ideal could Kohlberg insist that the, that the teaching of it was the only, and I quote again, the only constitutionally legitimate form of moral education in the schools, okay? 
There's more I could say about the psychological tradition of inclusive education, but let me move on to the neo-traditionalist, the neoclassical models. Think of Bill Bennett in the Book of Virtues, okay? The imperative for an inclusive morality for children is equally unquestioned among the neo-traditionalist moral, educator, moral educators, except that they pursue inclusiveness not in psychology, but in anthropology. Thus, when these educators affirm what C.S. Lewis called the Tao, they affirm moral principles found across all traditional cultures, principles for which there is no essential disagreement. Likewise, when they speak of their commitment to the timeless values of the Judeo-Christian ethic, they speak of values that are enduring across time and therefore values that transcend contention and conflict. Now the third major school of moral education approaches it differently. The communitarians um, approach inclusivity not in psychology, not in anthropology, but rather in sociology. That is, in a social consensus that is continually rediscovered and forged anew as a social contract among various and dissimilar individuals. Needless to say, consensus values are values that are explicitly shared and affirmed and therefore generate no friction. This chorus is repeated by the large host of educators charged with translating this mandate into practice. For instance, the former state superintendent of schools in California insisted that teachers instruct children in the common ethical convictions of the American people, and I quote, the, eth the ideals and standards we as a society hold to be worthy of praise and emulation. Groups like Character Counts also insist, and I quote, there are some universal core values that can be taught, values that are not identified with any single political or religious tradition. You study the laws of different states, you find the same thing, and I can go on and give you nauseating detail how this in fact plays out. My point is this, that while the imperative to teach a morality of inclusivity is beyond dispute, and while there are indisputable goods in pursuing it, in pursuing in inclusivity is also not without cost. All right? And let me turn my attention to that. The unintended consequence of a strategy of inclusiveness in moral and ethical education is that it can only be pursued by emptying lived morality of its particularity. Those thick, normative meanings whose seriousness and authority are embedded within social organizations of distinct communities and the collective rituals and narratives that give those communities continuity over time. The net effect of this denial of particularity that's implicit within a strategy of inclusiveness is to engage in some extraordinary evasions. Let me just illustrate. Consider, for example, the treatment of moral exemplars in the, in the psychological strategy. Kohlberg's cognitive developmentalism is, is unique in the psychological strategy, but his treatment of Martin Luther King is actually typical. King is enshrined as the personification of a just human being. In Kohlberg's model, he exemplifies stage six moral reasoning autonomous, conscious-oriented morality pointing toward universal principles of justice. And yet it is though King's race, Southern heritage, generational moment, faith, and theological training, all of the inconvenient particularities that bore on his leadership in the civil rights movement were utterly incidental to his vision and his moral courage. Those particularities are simply erased, ignored. It's as though they don't exist at all. Though the circumstances and issues are so different, it's certainly the same effort to evade the sticky problem of particularity 
that the psychological strategies tend to avoid issues like the moral dilemmas surrounding abortion, gender, homosexuality, other sexual issues, and so on. These matters simply cannot be addressed without getting into the particularities of moral commitment and the traditions and communities that ground those commitments. But that's just one side. The neo-traditionalists deny particularity as well, but in its own way. When the advocates of the neo-traditionalists perspective champion the Tao, the Tao, or the Judeo-Christian ethic, in fact, they are championing an ethic that has never existed in reality and now only exists as an ethical abstraction or as a political slogan. Communitarians do the same thing, and I won't go into that. I'll just keep, keep, keep moving along. Um, one of the things that happens with the denial of particularity and one of the evasions that happens is the um, avoidance of the why questions, the why questions um, behind moral agency. Why should one tell the truth rather than a lie? Why should someone shun cruelty in favor of compassion? Why should one pursue fairness for others when one's own interests are not served? And on and on and on. These are natural questions to ask, and not just by children. They point to the deep, long-standing questions at the foundation of moral philosophy. Far from abstract philosophical inquiry, these why questions are implied every time we witness evil or cruelty or betrayal and we ask, why did they do this? Why did they commit such a horrid act? And they arise just as often when we witness acts of great kindness or self-sacrifice and we ask, where did that generosity come from? But for the most part, moral educators believe that the virtues are self-evident goods that need no justification. The historical and empirical problem is that the reasons why should one should be good are many. Their stubborn plurality signals just the kind of irreducible differences that cannot be homogenized into an encompassing morality. In response to the question, why be good? or why not be cruel, a commitment to inclusiveness limits one either to the banalities of therapeutic or utilitarian reasoning or to just awkward silence. In sum, the subtext of an inclusive moral and ethics education is not the absence of a, mor of a morality, but rather the emptying of meaning and significance and authority from the morality that is advocated. The effort to affirm an inclusive morality reduces morality to the thinnest of platitudes, severed from the social, historical, and cultural encumbrances that finally make them concrete and ultimately compelling. Virtues are espoused as ungrounded generalities that can be found in various social organizations and cultural traditions, but they're not essentially linked to them. So deprived of anchoring in any normative community, this morality retains little authority beyond its own aesthetic appeal. In the same way, by rendering the self either prior to or outside of community and culture, contemporary moral education empties the self of any concrete social and metaphysical grounding. And you see, the problem here is that there have never before existed in history generic values, okay? That's the problem. And yet this is precisely the subtext of contemporary strategies of moral action. That's what they end up offering. So why is this a real problem? Why should one, anyone worry about the specifics, especially since we are so likely to disagree on those specifics? as long as we're united on the overarching and overall norms? Well, this is the question that Charles Taylor addressed in his, question, in his book, The Sources of the Self. 
He suggested that it's the particularities that lead us to the sources of morality, the sources that sustain our commitment to goodness and fair play. The answer to these questions speak to the higher purposes that take us beyond ourselves and that in turn make morality compelling. It's one thing, he argues, to affirm general standards of goodness and quite another to be motivated by a strong understanding that human beings are eminently worth helping or treating with justice, that is, of having a sense of dignity or value. High ethical standards, Taylor has argued, require strong moral sources, and without them, there is little imperative and no direction for moral action. Let me skip ahead very briefly to the end of this section and then bring my remarks to a close. My point really is, is this, that the mor when, when moral and ethical discourse are taken out of the particularity of moral community, the social networks and rituals that define its practice, the Weltanschauung that gives it significance and coherence, and the communal narrative that forms its memory both the self and the ethical ideals it seeks to inculcate operate in a void. Filling that void, in part, is a system of rules, laws, procedures, principles, and entitlements designed to ensure due process among individuals and groups who are assumed to be maximizing their own interests. A myriad of good intentions stand behind each system of compliance, each federal and state regulation, and each court order. But here, too, there are unintended consequence. In such an environment, the very idea of developing values, cultivating character, seeking justice, generating good human beings is difficult to imagine, much less realize. So let me bring my comments to a close. What I've been arguing here then is that the structural, that structural realities built into the modern world, the major cultural movements within scholarship and aesthetics, and the leading moral strategies we have developed to address the problems in morality and ethics all reinforce each other. What does this mean? Well, first it means that the narrative I've tried to unpack is fundamentally different from the dominant narratives about morality in American culture today. The story I have tried to tell is not so much a story of liberation, though liberation is clearly something we all enjoy. Nor is it a story of decline, though one finds evidence, clearly, of moral corruption and decadence, deterioration, and so on. The story I've tried to unpack is a story in two parts. First, it's a story of change in the moral life of a society, change operating along historical and sociological dynamics that are largely out of our control. This is very, very important. The second part of the story is a story of tragedy, of how the very strategies we invent to address this change fails to address the root problems because it's of a fabric with those problems. As Einstein once put it, you cannot solve a problem within the paradigm that created the problem in the first place. So there we are. What do we know? We know that there is no reversal of history or simple recovery of older virtues. Here, traditionalists long for something they simply cannot have. We also know that our strategies of moral and ethical action are utterly captive to the society in which it exists. They're part and parcel of the very problems we want to solve. In this regard, it's clear that even in its diversity and its oppositions, our strategy is more a story of the legitimation of American culture than it is about its challenge and transformation. Thirdly, we also know that consistent moral and ethical action outside of a lived community the entanglements of complex social relationships and their shared story is difficult, if not impossible. 
So what can be done? I'm going to probably leave it there, but it does seem to me that the central questions that animate this conference are time together. Indeed, the central questions that animate the Wheatley Institution is not ethics, is not, is ethics in decline and what we can do about it, but rather how do moral cultures change in their totality, change and, and what, if anything, people might do to influence that change in ways that secure genuine benevolence and just, genuine justice in a highly diverse society. This will entail a basic rethinking of our current understanding of the relationship between morality, moral commitment, family, child rearing, public life, economic institutions, democratic institutions, and so on, and how to thicken our commitments within all of them. Strategies of moral pedagogy and ethical action simply will follow in turn. The task is large. The rethinking, the nature and complex relationships that I'm talking about is something that a new institute, such as the Wheatley Institution, can aspire to do. At the end of the day, the central puzzle we have to figure out is how morality becomes authoritative, such that it becomes binding on the conscience and compelling within communities. Moral authority, I would contend, cannot be established simply by recognizing, building, or asserting consensus values. Likewise, character cannot develop out of values that are chosen by a committee, or negotiated by a group of educators, or enacted into law by legislators. These values have, by their very nature, lost the quality of sacredness, their commanding character, and thus their power to inspire and to constrain. So what are the possibilities? Implicit in the word ethics or morality is in fact a story. It's a story about living for a purpose that is greater than the self. And though that purpose resides deeply within, its origins are outside of the self. And so it beckons one forward, channeling one's passions to mostly quiet acts of devotion heroism, sacrifice, and achievement. Thank you.